The following interview was conducted with Janice Voss, alumna, class of 1975, and the first female graduate to fly in space for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, Wednesday, January the 12th, 2011, in Stewart Center at Purdue University. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Mm -hmm. Welcome, and thank you very much, Janice. I appreciate the opportunity. My pleasure. I hope we still get to do a video one at some point. I know. We, 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 that's part two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early years and a little bit about high school? Uh, so I was born in South Bend, Indiana. We moved when I was about three, so I don't really have any memories of South Bend. Uh -huh. When we first get selected as an astronaut, they put out the press release. At that time, all they have is the place that you're born. It's in your paperwork that you submitted. Uh -huh. Once you get down here at NASA, they let you pick your hometown, which would be a town that's more meaningful to you. Okay. But when the press release went out, it said South Bend. Sure. So the South Bend newspaper called me and said, so what do you remember about South Bend? And I said, well, I lived on the corner. <laughs> I think <laughs> so I remember where the house was. I'll ask my mother, right? Yeah. Um, they never called me again. Because <laughs> Rockford, Illinois is now this is my hometown. Okay. You've had most of so, your early years there. Uh -huh. Right, so we moved to Rockford when I was three, um, or the year I was three. Mm -hmm. um, that's my dad was born in Rockford, and his he grew up there. His four sisters all still live in Rockford. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of family ties there. Half of my cousins on my dad's side live in Illinois, either Rockford, Chicago, or Champaign, Urbana kind of choices. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot of family ties there, and I was there from. 59 to 67, so okay. that's where my accent comes from. And okay, sounds good. So then uh, we, we moved to Massachusetts, job change for my dad, mm -hmm. and I was there until I left to go to Purdue. And okay. then my parents left Massachusetts 20 years ago, it's how time flies, yeah. and retired to the family farm in southern Indiana. Oh, okay. So my mother's dad was born, and then since then, all the generations, and we'll see what happens with this generation, on a farm in DuPont, Indiana. Okay. Which has been in my family all the time, so of course I've known it since I was small. Sure. You spent some time there, too? Yeah, I've spent, you know, summer vacations and Christmases and Thanksgivings and oh, how nice. time over yeah. the years there. I was there for Christmas this year. Oh, very. Oh, on New Year's Eve. Oh, hey, we start. Good way to start 2011. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> okay. Can you tell us a little about high school? Were there uh, what kind of, any particular teacher that you recall and, and what program were you taking? Yeah, lots hmm? of interesting things in high school. Good. I've been I'm a little precocious. Um, my oldest sister, Vicki, likes to claim credit for my entire space career, which is fine. It's a joke, really, when she does that because... Families have those little inside things. Right. Um, when she was learning to read, I would sit and listen. So I learned to read with her, basically. Wonderful. And, and so I knew how to read before kindergarten. Very good. So they took me, my kindergarten teacher recognized that, Janice Noble who I invited to my first flight, but she was ill by that time and couldn't come. Um, she, she recognized that and worked with the school system to put me into what was actually a remedial second grade program from kindergarten. Uh -huh. And the remedial second grade, you spend the first like month doing a quick refresher of first grade, which is basically just reading. Sure. And then you join the rest of the second grade class. So I basically skipped first grade. Wow. That way, um, which put me a year, a year ahead. And my birthday's in October, and in Illinois, they, the the year break, the grade break is, at that time at least was in January, mm -hmm. so I was one of the youngest in my class anyway. Then I was a year younger because of that. I moved to Massachusetts, and Massachusetts the break is in September. Wow! So that put me another year younger <laughs> than oh, everybody in my class. Oh dear! Um, and so I was I was pretty young, and then in, and I did high school in three years. That's credit to my parents and and the school system. Again, they recognized I was running out of classes to take. Mm -hmm. And so they, the school system allowed me in my senior year to take, I need, you needed four years of English. Okay. So in my senior year, they let me take one a course of English as a study. Instead of a, my, my study hour, one of the teachers volunteered her time to, to give me an English class during my study hour so I could get my four-year English requirement in, in three years. Wow. Um, and I did a summer program at University of Illinois sponsored by the National Science Foundation in this summer between my sophomore and senior year, mm -hmm. and that gave me a science course credit. Wow. All of which gave me enough credits to graduate um, a year early. Okay. Did you graduate in the spring then? Would that have been a spring thing? Yeah, so right. I graduated okay. normal spring, but just a year early. Okay. Okay. Um, um, any acti student activities that you were involved in there? Well, I had a, um, 
Yeah, I did. I'm sure I was in a debating club. That was fun. I was in this thing called As Schools Match Wits, which is the high school version of the college bowl. Okay. You have two teams that ask, answer trivia questions, right? That was really fun. Ooh, yes. Um, th in fact, it, it, that one, the As Schools Match Wits thing, evolved into a family joke that became quite famous. I have a picture I keep in my scrapbook. Um, there was, we, the year I was in, we made it to the finals. And the state finals? No, it's just, just local. Oh, okay. Just local. Uh huh. It's just, you know, like Holyoke School, you know, but just sure. the local high school. Okay. And um, in the semifinal match, when, you know, when we won the semifinal match, I was so excited. I just jumped out of my seat and I was jumping around the stage. Oh, we made it, we made it. <laughs> and the cameras were still rolling. And, and I didn't know that because I didn't actually watch the show when sure. I wasn't on it, right? So sure. apparently they used that as the tag video for a long time. Oh, my goodness. And so my, my parents would tease me about it, right? <laughs> so um, on my first launch, you, you fly down to the, to the K, to Kenny Space Center three days before launch because they, they've got time. You go into quarantine a week before, and you fly down in, in midway through that week. And so if there's bad weather or something, you have some maneuvering room. And when you arrive at the Cape, they, you do a press conference to thank all the folks at the Cape for all the hard work and wh whoever else you, you know, whoever else you feel like saying. Mm -hmm. Of course, my first flight was SCS 57, so there were lots and lots of crews in front of me that had made this speech, and it's pretty hard to be terribly original, right? But that's okay, everybody understands that. Um, so, so I had a couple of things in mind. We had slipped a few times, and I was going to thank him for, you know, hanging in there with us through all the slips. And, the weather had been great every single time, and I was going to say, well, it's nice of you guys to arrange this great and all this stuff. And every single thing I had thought of, some I was the most junior member of the crew at that point by order in the crew and whatever, so I was the last one to speak. Mm -hmm. Somebody else on my crew had just said it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I got five seconds here to think of something, anything, right, that they haven't, it hasn't already been said that's not too bizarro. And, of course, if I had more than five seconds, I would never have done this. But my parents were there. They had come down for lunch, and, and they were there in the crowd with the press. The, the, um, I wasn't married at the time, and my, they arranged to have normally your spouse there. So as soon as the press conference is over, they can come over and say hi and, and talk to you. Because sure. I didn't have a spouse. They had both my parents there. And, and I saw my parents in the crowd, and I said, this is the time. Because when I had when I got in the call that I was going to be like this astronaut, they said, "Did you jump up and down the elevator, and make the whole building shake?" And I said, "No." And as I'm walking up to Mike and thinking, "But now's the time," so I just I just jumped in the air and I said, "As my family knows, I'm excited." I just jump all over the place and I'm certainly excited today. And <laughs> some photographer caught me in midair, <laughs> and it was in the paper, so I have a copy of that picture. And the best thing about it is. That particular shot showed all my crew members in the background, and you can see the commander with his wide eyes, right, and the <laughs> pilot who's just rolling on the ground laughing. That was a su superb. You know, it was so good. Your, so your personal launch. Yes. <laughs> and, and the pilot was so nice. I mean, as soon as I done it, I'm like, oh, man, Janice, that was the stupidest thing you have ever done, right? And I was so, I was so worried the commander was going to say, Janice, you just embarrassed the whole crew, you know? But the pilot, Brian Duffy, came over to me as you're we walking back, as the families are coming over and walking back. He, he put his arm around me and said, Janice, we all wish we could do that. None of us ever had the guts. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Fine. Yeah, Congratulations. So That's great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had a French teacher in high school who um, was very good about motivating kids, and she got me involved in tennis. She was the head of the tennis mm -hmm. uh, program there. I remember her, and she came to my first launch, um, and I had a calculus teacher who was really outstanding and was, you know, they talk about how women lose interest in math and science, which I probably wouldn't have done anyway because of my dad and my, and he was very interested in that. It was fun working with him on it. But that calculus teacher kept that moving, Mr. Bamford. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are a couple of standouts, plus, of course, the English teacher who gave her time to tutor. Yeah, me. very um, nice. How large was the high school? How about what? How, how large was the high school about? Uh, about 4,000 people. Oh, okay. All right. So a good size high school, but not huge. Sure. Okay. Then next came college. How did you happen to uh, decide to come to Purdue? I apply. I, you know, I'm one of these people, uh, I'll give you the, the, the version I give when I give talks, because it, it comes to some more questions that come to later. I'll put this all in one. Right. When I talk to, to especially high school or college students about mm -hmm. 
you know, career paths. I don't get a sure. lot of questions how to be an astronaut. Right. And, and my particular college history is, is one that I think is in, in a high, if you look at my bio, it goes, wow, how could, you know, people say, how could I ever do what she did? And I say, well, this is how it looked when I was living it. Okay, mm-hmm. so, yeah, I've always wanted to be an astronaut since I was in grade school, but, you know, did I have a clue when I was in high school? It's yeah. 1972, the aerospace industry is crashing. Everybody's saying you can't go into aeronautics. There won't be any jobs. There were a few quiet voices, one or two, saying, well, yeah, that's everybody's hearing, and so when you graduate from college, there won't be any aerospace graduates, and you'll have no trouble getting jobs. But, you know, there's always that one or two-year phasing issue, right? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I was pretty nervous about aerospace engineering. And it wasn't in 72, there wasn't a big curriculum anyway, right? It was still pretty uncommon. Mm-hmm. And so what am I going to do? Right? I don't know. I like math and science, and that's about as far as I could get. I want to be in the space program. You know, they didn't even sure they're going to have a space program when I graduate, right? Um, so I only looked at schools that had programs where you didn't have to pick a major. Okay. Purdue, as you know, has the freshman engineering year. Right. Where you don't pick your actual degree program until the second year, and the first year is all common courses. Correct. And they actually have a seminar where you get to hear from all the departments. Yeah, Engineering 100. Right. So um, that obviously was very attractive. Florida, University of Florida had an engineering physics program. University of Illinois had a general engineering program. They, they, they didn't have that same common thing, but you, in other words, at, at Illinois, you never picked. Right. You stayed in general engineering, and, and you got a a spectrum of courses, which you could specialize a bit. And University of Michigan had mm-hmm. an engineering physics program. Okay. So I only applied to those four schools mm-hmm. and um, got into all four of them. Purdue was head and shoulders above the rest in terms of their the quality of the materials they sent and the friendliness of the materials. They offered up someone to talk to about life at Purdue before they'd even before you even accepted, right? If you just wanted to call up and ask. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had someone you could call before, and of course they offered lots of opportunities to visit campus, really helpful and, and informative and well put together information about course choices, and, and so it was kind of a, it was fortunately an easy decision, right? I thought this was going to be really hard, and I'm sure at the time it was harder than I remember it being, but I, I um, Well, you knew what you were looking for, and these things kind of, kind of came into play, the uh, uh, reciprocity and the interest and uh, little pl- pluses that they added on to your application right on a personal on a personal it was enough, basis it was enough to make the difference that's yeah. right exactly what would uh, now when you came on campus wh- where did you uh, live in issue were you in a sorority or I was in Meredith oh okay because um, I wanted to be in a dorm to start with it, mm-hmm. was, it was easy and and I did go through rush but freshmen that engineering 101 one of the groups that talks is the co-op program Oh, okay. And I'm thinking, well, okay, my parents have told me, don't waste your time earning money. We want you to get the best education you can. We'll pay. You know, you don't need a job. Just wor- work on your schooling and, you know, do well. Sure. So I said, well, this isn't going to be anything for me because it's a job, right? And then he said, one of the companies that we have co-ops with is NASA. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, and including NASA Johnson Space Center, right? I called up my parents that night and said, oh, I heard about this great program. And this was another watershed event, event in my life. So what do you think? And they're like, well, we never heard about the co-op program. You're just going to have to do do your best to see if it's the right thing for you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you guys <laughs> always have the answer. How can you tell me I'm supposed to do my own thinking? <laughs> <laughs> the next um, stage. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it turns out that they the opening at John, they had one opening at Johnson Space Center. It was in January mm-hmm. of my freshman year. Okay. There was an opening at Goddard in the summer, which is when co-ops normally start. They do a full year on campus. But it wouldn't. I couldn't go to Johnson if I waited until the summer. Mm-hmm. I had enough credits from some AP courses that I had taken, and then tested out of some stuff at Purdue. Mm-hmm. Had enough credits to be classified as a sophomore in January. Oh, okay. So that allowed me to start co-oping in January. Okay. So of I your which of your freshman of year? My freshman year. Okay. Yeah. Good. And so I had the one semester in Meredith, and then in the summer. The only dorm that's open is Earhart. Uh-huh. So I went through Rush, but by the time I went through Rush, I knew I was going to be a co-op. And at the time, sororities did not take co-op students. Okay. So it was an option. I understand now that they do. Zeta Alpha, I think, is maybe one of the first, if not the only. Um, and Zeta Alpha, oddly enough, was my mother's sorority, so it would have been great. But mm-hmm. um, at the time, I, I didn't have that option. Because what they, I guess, what they do is they pair up co-ops. They take two co-ops on opposite schedules. And okay. Work for, but at the time, I, so I didn't, I didn't 
joined the sorority. Okay. Um, so in the summer of that year, I was in Earhart because it was the only dorm that was open. And then I was back in the following spring. At uh, Johnson? So, so I was at... Okay. So I started in, in at Purdue in the fall of 72. Mm -hmm. uh, spring of 72, I was at Johnson. Summer of 72, I was at Earhart. Fall of 72, I was at Johnson. No, it's, sorry, 73. Spring mm -hmm. of 73, I was at Johnson. Summer of 73, I was at Earhart. Fall of 73, I was back at Johnson. Spring of 74, I was then... Then it was just whatever dorm had space, right? Sure. And I ended up in... I think that's when I was in Dumi with a friend of mine, Pat, who I... Tuberky, who wasn't Tuberky at the time. I've forgotten what her maiden name was. Um, she wanted a roommate. She wanted to get a single, but she couldn't get it yet, so she wanted a roommate, and she knew me, so she asked, so she had, you know, said, you want to join me in this in the spring? I said, sure. Mm -hmm. And then I was back at Johnson in the summer, and in the fall, she already, fall of 70, so our fall of 74. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to lose track a bit, but she then she did get her single, so she didn't want to room with me again, and I ended up with, in Wood, I think, and... Or maybe I got, well, I have to think of this. I ended up, oh, I did a double co-op. Okay. I ended up, it became clear I might graduate early. Uh -huh. So I think I did a double co-op in order to get my five co-ops in before the end. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and I ended up graduating in December of 70. Five, is it? I'm thinking it was 70. So yeah, December 75, because I started January of 76 at MIT. Okay, okay. Um, and I also only got one semester on campus at the end. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have two semesters sequentially on campus my sure. entire Purdue career. Wow. But to answer your question about, when we get to the question about Purdue traditions, yeah. I really didn't get a chance to connect to any traditions. Okay. Because even if I found something I liked, if it yeah. typically they happen the same semester every year, right? Right. So the next year I wasn't there. That's right. Were you the only uh, person from Purdue at Johnson at that time? I don't remember. Okay, okay. Were you, did the, um, as part of the co-op, did you move around in other departments or were you in the same uh, unit, perhaps? I only moved once. Okay. Um, they, I first joined, I first co-op when I was with a group that did the pyrotechnics for parachutes to okay. do the explosive releases. Uh-huh. And, and they had a co-op stop, but they really didn't, they hadn't had a co-op. Okay. And they didn't really know what to do with me, and I'm there and... I remember talking to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I'm just wasting my time. He said, time is never wasted. Find something productive. Read a textbook. You know, study up from your courses for next semester. Sure. If they don't have something for you, you find something that you know is productive. And after about half through the semester, I, and I had no assignments yet, I talked to the co-op office, and they said, well, we just never move a co-op mid-semester. And I said, well, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And we all agreed they moved me actually mid-co-op mid term to uh, the hybrid computation and simulation branch which at the time, analog computers were the way simulations were done to get real time, because mm -hmm. the digitals were too slow. And so I finished my first co-op term there and did, did all the rest of them in that branch. Mm, okay. It was really a great place. They had analog and digital computers, so I did both. Wonderful. I did great experience. Computers. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah. And it really tied in well, because I come back to campus and a lot of the stuff I've been studying at school, either I had just stayed at school and it came up technically some issue about you know designing uh, airplanes or something came up, or I learned some new computer technique and I used it the sure. next semester on campus. It right. was really a great experience there. Right. That co-op um, program is, is good. Yeah, yeah, it was just wonderful. I highly recommend it. For, mm -hmm. you know, again, it, it's a different experience. You lose a lot of the college experience that people have. I have much weaker college memories in the sense of the traditions you're talking sure, about. Sure, I understand. And I, I don't have very many friends from college because I, you know, I wasn't around. Right. Um, but but it, all, had, it all works out. It know? all works out. Sure. Now I have this great tie with co-ops. Right. I had a lot of co-ops stay with me, rent room in my house down here. It's, you know, this is a different, it's a different concept. So you could say in terms of tradition, the co-op one is a great one, but most people don't think that, it's a pretty That's a good one. Right? That's fine. That's very good. Um, okay. What came next then? Do you want to talk okay. a little about a yeah, so, Go so ahead. Let me run through my career path that I, that I finished. Sure. So I, say, so I say to people, so... I was in high school, I couldn't figure out what to do either. So I, I picked these schools and I ended up picking Purdue because it was the, the friendliest place. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was aware that at that time, 
it was the university that had the most civilian astronauts, mm -hmm. most astronauts from a civilian university. Most of them astronauts had been military from a military graduate program, but the, in terms of civilian universities, it was the leading one. But that was not, in fact, a determining factor okay. at all. Okay. But it was a nice bonus, right, to have classes in Grissom Hall. Right, exactly. Um, That's right. So I, I discovered the co-op program, um, got involved, and I was very happy to do it. And in my, when, I was, when it became clear, I, was, I had a choice of graduating with one credit to spare in December or finishing out my full senior year on campus. And I decided what I would do is I would apply to my top favorite schools MIT, Caltech, and Stanford for graduate school. If I got into one of those, I would go in January. Okay. If I didn't get in, I would finish out my, my senior year at Purdue and then just apply to a whole bunch of schools. So I applied, and they all turned me down. Okay, fine. Uh, my boss at the time at NASA was a MIT grad. He said, there is no way MIT would not accept you. So he called up a professor buddy of his, um, who said, who checked into it and said, well, the problem is you applied to the admissions department. What was I thinking, right? <laughs> he said, the admissions department only does fall admissions. They turned you down because you're applying for January. So he sent my application directly to the graduate department. And um, they admitted me and gave me a fellowship. Hmm. Now, if I, if I, it may have been the same problem with Caltech and Stanford, and it's possible if I'd known the right way to approach it, I would have gotten into all three. I don't know. Yeah. But the way it worked out, that's how I ended up at MIT, was because hmm. My boss at, at NASA was an MIT grad Great. who helped me out. Right. So I get to MIT. Oh, by the way, the other thing is I, en I ended up picking engineering sciences at Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, and halfway through that program, they decided to eliminate that as a separate program and fold it into interdisciplinary engineering. Sure. So I was in the last graduating class of engineering sciences. And of, that, saying, of that yeah, particular program? Of the engineering sciences program, right? Okay. So like, well, that's going to be a world of this degree because nobody's going to know what it is, right? Yeah, there are any sure. graduates. Okay, fine. So I get to MIT. Um, I'm in the aero department. I'm finally, so I, um, I went, one of the reasons I went into engineering sciences because I was still worried about aerospace as a major. Purdue did have an aerospace stuff, but the engineering sciences courses could be in most any department. They would give you a list. You have to take a double E course. You have to take a structures course. Here's all the possible ones. And I always picked the courses in the aero department. So I took most of my courses in the aero department without having a degree that said aero. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, then you can argue that engineering sciences wasn't turned out not to be, but it doesn't matter, right? That's why I picked engineering sciences. And so I get to Purdue. Um, they had, or get to uh, MIT. They had a, a program jointly with the double E department that was called instrumentation. So great, I love uh, electronics and I can do aero stuff, this would be great. So I, I entered through the aero department but in the instrumentation program. The semester I start, they decide to cancel that program. Oh. Um, and they said, but we're not, and that was a straight to PhD program. And they said, well, we're not gonna kick you guys out without a degree. So we're gonna let you terminate with a master's and you can pick either department, independent of how you entered. You can pick either department, so well, great. I'll pick double E, double E degree will look wonderful on my resume, right? So I, I ended up with a double E degree with the thesis title of Optimization of Variable Mixture Ratio Rocket Boosters. Uh, but it's a double E degree. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, oh, by the way, my master's thesis advisor died of a heart attack while I was halfway through my master's. And fortunately, another per person was kind enough to pick up that research topic, which wasn't theirs, right, and, and mm -hmm. let me finish. So it's now um, summer of 77. Mm -hmm. NASA has announced they're going to select a new class of astronauts, but they haven't yet. And uh, so I decided to go down to Johnson Space Center. And I did send in my application, didn't get selected. Been working at NASA for a year and decided I didn't really like the career path I could see ahead of me at NASA and I should go back and get a PhD to give me more choices. Mm -hmm. But I, I really liked being at NASA. And so my plan was to go to Rice University I, I um, checked out there, then about this time I'm thinking, you know, Janice, you really might not get to be an astronaut. You probably should really think about plan B. And I was interested in material science and astronomy. Mm -hmm. So I looked into the astronomy departments in the area and Rice had a really strong one. I liked the campus and there was a professor there who was jointly working for NASA and a professor in the astrophysics department who was looking for a graduate student to do satellite solar power station development. Well, perfect, because I have an engineering background, so he liked me. It's in astrophysics, so I get all that background. The degree would be astrophysics, and I could see if I really liked astronomy, astrophysics stuff. And while doing my thesis, I would still be working at NASA. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, 
got all that accepted lined up the August before I was supposed to start in September the contract gets canceled uh. so, okay well it's all set up I'm going to give it a try spent a year in astrophysics took a bunch of courses which was very interesting found a lab to work in that was that was using lasers to excite atoms to look like sun atmospheres mm -hmm. and very interesting work but not something I felt I could really get into enough to do a PhD and I'm thinking okay now what I went to I just I'm keeping my professional contacts open went to a conference at Johnson Space Center on space station ran into an MIT buddy of mine who is now a professor there and he said oh we're looking for some graduate students to do solar cell manufacturing in orbit We've got, he was in the aero department. We've got all these aero people, but we need someone to do the, the material science silicon solar cell part. I said, great, material science is the other thing that's interesting. I'll come back to MIT. Um, and by this time, I was willing, you know, I had enough confidence in myself and, uh, and agreed with the general thing. At the PhD level, it sort of doesn't matter what your degree is. That really shows your interest. Mm -hmm. But you're really le learning research skills that, that, you know, they don't really care what your degree is in. So I was happy. I was willing to actually get an aerospace degree. <laughs> and so I went back in the aerospace department with a committee that was both aero and material science. Worked on that for two years. That contract got canceled. I'm like, okay, someone's trying to tell me something here. Um, had had a, one of those thesis advisors died. Um, and <laughs> and then I had a, one of my aero advisors didn't get tenure and left. When I was trying to replace the arrow advisor, I, this is the same the same guy who had recruited me into the program. I said, "You want to be on the committee?" He said, "Janice, I'm too young to be on one of your committees." <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> they, you know, um, so I said, "Okay." I, I explored all the things I wanted. That material science wasn't my big love anyway. I really do like engineering, so I went back to Draper Labs where I had my fellowship, and they put me on internal research and development money, which I figured was pretty safe to look at some um, control stuff for space station. And that's where I ended up getting my PhD. And then like six months before I was supposed to graduate my PhD, the chairman of my committee didn't get tenure and left MIT. Mm. Um, and MIT was nice enough to let him finish off and sign off on my paperwork, even though he was no longer at MIT. Oh, that was good. All right. right. So when I, so I tell people, yeah, you look at my bio, it says she has a degree in engineering sciences. She has a degree in electrical engineering. She has a degree in aerospace engineering. She, along the way, got some background in astronomy and material science. It goes like, wow. How did you ever manage all of that? And <laughs> you're so flexible, and you've got, so, you know, like, you know, at the time I was barely hanging on by the skin of my teeth, right? Just, but the lesson to learn is treat everything as a as a problem to be solved, right? Not as a disaster to be. And survived. you certainly expressed that in the conversation that you just been talked yeah. about, right? Exactly. You just, you just look at what the options are in front of you. You know, listen to what you. I tell them, listen to what you're good at and what you enjoy doing. Right, exactly. And follow the path. Don't let people tell you, you know, the universe took a few rounds, but it finally got me into aerospace engineering, right? Okay. You, you know, it, people people will tell you, might tell you that's the wrong place for you, and, and maybe it was at the time. For sure. Okay. Um, but, if you keep, but eventually, you know, you keep listening, and, and maybe eventually becomes the right thing, and then you can maybe turn. Right, so you do a little, little fine-tuning along the way. Right, you listen to people, you take their input, but you make your own decisions. Sure. And, and you look on it as everything everything is an opportunity and a problem to be solved. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see, then, let's talk about the astronaut program. How, tell, I think for researchers, how does one apply and uh, when you finally are selected? And the, the application is just, it's really just like any other job. Okay. You send in the application, they uh, may ask you for or Do they accept them all the time? Or is it always, oh, and is it always an open thing? And researchers, can any, anybody send an application at any time? Or? I'm, not, I'm not sure right now. Okay. Because they went to this web-based application process, and I don't know exactly how that works. Sure, okay. It, it used to be you could send in any time, and they would just collect them until they were ready to take people. Okay. But I never bothered until they had an announcement, because your stuff is all going to be out of date, right? There's just no right. point in sending exactly. in between. Exactly. And it goes to the bottom of the, you know, whatever. Right, <laughs> right. But then, how do they uh, let you know then that you've been, you know, accepted? Well, they um, the first stage is paperwork. Okay. And once I get here, of course, I well, actually along the way, you know, you talk to people who are interviewed and stuff, and you can figure out they they go through a just a paperwork review process and they rate the applicant based on their paperwork. Okay. And then on, on those app, on those ratings, they decide who to interview. Okay. So the the first gate will be that they see I think. 
because kids knew better at the time, but you're always watching for the, you know, the sign that you've made the next step, right? Sure. So I think, I think the first thing you get is the phone call for an interview. Once you send it in, of course, you get the acknowledgement that your paperwork. That, well, no, the first gate is they might send it back and say, sorry, you're not qualified. Okay. That happened to a few people, but that you should know, right? Mm -hmm. So that gate should be pretty easy to pass. So the next one will be they'll call you for an interview um, or not. And, and my, the, the year that I was interviewed, I ended up in the last interview group, so I was getting pretty nervous. But, and I applied four times. That's another lesson I pass on. Okay. You know, never give up, never surrender. You can change your mind. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind, but don't do it from a p position of surrender. Right, okay. Something you want to do, keep trying. That's right, exactly. Um, Good so point. I, um, so you get, I got the call to be interviewed. I think the last group is actually kind of nice because you don't have to wait so long to find out. So you, the w interview is a week-long process. That's a little bit unusual, but that's because of the physical requirements. They do a lot of testing, okay. medical testing and strength testing and stuff like that just to sure. kind of make sure you're basically healthy. It's not a hard test to pass, but a lot of people – they find things that people didn't know they had. Right. That often happens in other, you know, situations too. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it is a very thorough physical. Oh yeah. And it's, but it's, again, it's not. It's basically an FAA class three, which is what pilots pass to get their pilot's license. Okay. It's not hard to pass, but you have to be fit. Right. You have to be fit and healthy. Um, and there's a few extra ones with um, you have to not be colorblind and things like that. Sure. And yet, do you have to have good? How was the vision? Is that kind of key too? Well. Um, it's been slowly getting less stringent. Okay. okay. It's it's now I think twenty two hundred, which is like not for mission specialists, not hardly a limitation at all. There okay. Very few people get limited. The early on vision was more of an issue. Okay. But again, they knew what they would publish it, and only people that came that the people that write on the edge might come down here and might or might not pass. Everybody else they just didn't apply, right? Okay. They wouldn't pass. I understand. Um, in that week, there's one hour with the selection board. And that's a rather non-traditional interview because they have all your paperwork and they have all the ratings and all the filtering that went into that. Uh, they really just want to try to get a sense of you as a person, so they ask you to start with high school and talk about your life. They, there's always an essay question that you get. Typically, you arrive on Sunday and you get the essay question on Sunday. You have to write an essay that they, the board reads right before you come in. Many times, it's um, why do I want to be an astronaut, but it's not always that. Okay. Um, do you don't know in advance what the essay question is going to be? Correct. Okay. Like, again, that's the way it was done sure. in the office. I don't know if it's We're talking about that. the time. That, that's what I think the researchers, when you entered the program. Right, when I entered the program. That's right. That makes okay. Um, one of the people in my class who was a friend of mine from Rice, I met him as a graduate student at Rice, and we kind of kept in touch, and he wanted to be an astronaut. He had interviewed four times, and I was getting tired. He's like, come on. And in that time, the question was the same every year. So you can say you never knew the question in advance, but when it's been the same every year. You know what the question was. Yeah, my essay was written long before I, <laughs> was written and read by my family and all that long before sure. I got down to the interview. Uh, and he had, he got, he said, you know, I've answered this question three times before. It's not like these guys don't know what my answer is. So his, his total answer was, I like to travel. And that was the year he got in. <laughs> There's a, there's a general sense. I have the same sense. When you get to the point of saying, you know what, it would be great to get in, but it's not my life, that's when you get in. <laughs> it's when you're just, oh, man, I so want to be, I really want to get in. Those are the years you don't get in, right? I understand. <laughs> when you finally get to the point of being mature enough to say, I have other choices, then, you're, you, know, then you do well to interview. Mm -hmm. you relax and you're sure. calm. And Takes the edge off. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, now you've been accept you've been accepted in the program, and then then does the training start, or what what comes the next day? So I was selected in January sixteenth, nineteen ninety. The training started in July, and the first year is just basic training gets you off to speed, how to fly T thirty eight as a back seater, not as a front seater if you aren't already front seat qualified. All the emergency procedures. Here's what a shuttle is. Nowadays, it's here's what a space station is. Systems, science, life support all that kind of stuff so that the MDs, you know, they fly through the life sciences lectures and they really struggle with the how to fly T-38 lectures, right? So mm -hmm. pilots fly through the T-38 stuff and just can't hardly stay awake in the science ones. You know, someone like me, engineering, I do great in the systems classes and okay in the science classes because I had some science, but really had to work hard on the pilot T-38, you know. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and the idea is that y that year kind of gets you all the same place, levels out the okay. background. And 
then you become eligible for flight assignment and they start working through that until you get onto a flight because you can't all get assigned at the same time there are too many of you right you string out over the next couple of years mm -hmm. you have technical assignments where you are using what you've learned to help other astronauts get ready okay more valuable once you've flown but even before you've flown you have a lot of training and, it, and connection with the office that other groups don't have and it's your job to represent the issues that are specifically dominant for the crew not that other people couldn't do it but since the crew is there they expect you to do it right if you don't sure. do it nobody does it that's right exactly well you had quite a few uh, for the researchers perhaps you might talk at least um, I'll let you pick but I thought the first one that you might want to make a comment on that one the first uh, how you felt and things of that sort yeah so that um, the first one is a, is a really fun example because the, that was the first flight of the Space Hab module Okay. on my first flight. So I had been doing the, my technical assignment before I got my flight assignment was module stuff, Space Habs and Space Labs and all the experiments in them. So I had been working on the Space Hab module before I got assigned that flight. It may be part of the reason why they picked me for that flight. Because that's what was a, a, one of the key things on that flight. Right. Uh -huh. And it was the area that I ended up working on. We had a, a mm -hmm. we deployed and retrieved the Eureka, or retrieved rather the Eureka satellite had been deployed in an earlier flight. And I, I was the third robotics operator, so that was a lesser one of my responsibilities because I had less experience in that area. And the, and the space, the space center is some really great examples of what the crew provides that other people don't provide, in particular the one I remember. We have these crew reviews where you get the, a flown crew member together with the hardware and have them look at it and, and comment on improvements. Something you never think about until you've flown in space, but I see it all the time now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's dark under your desk, and you're like, well, okay, fine. But in space, you work the entire volume, and you don't want any dark corners. Right. Because you, you have to work there sometimes. Sure. And you just don't think about that. It's not something that jumps out at you until you've struggled with dark corners trying to run an experiment. And the space tab module, because people just think this way, right? The lights were all on the ceiling in a 1G orientation. The lights were all on the ceiling. And the corners at the floor were dark. Mm -hmm. And there were experiments that were supposed to be down there. So we, we had a flown crew member, Mark Lee, in this particular case, came in and did the review, and he said, you need to light those corners. And so space tab developed some stanchions, posts that you could put in the floor at the corners and put a um, spotlight on to mm -hmm. light the corners. And they covered the floor with white Teflon film, so it would reflect the ceiling light into the lower lockers. Better. Wow, very clever, nicely right. done. Yeah. Right. So that's the kind of thing that we can provide in our technical jobs. Sure. That's really valuable. That's right. So I, I got to fly on Space Hab. One of the fun things on that we did the to pick up the Eureka satellite, we had a, we rendezvoused with it, and it comes in over the payload bay. It's just the easy way to the way the shuttle is set up to the rendezvous brings things straight down over the middle of the payload bay like you've seen done with the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And I was back in the space, because we had the space hab, which had an overhead window, which was almost straight under the payload. I was back, my assignment for the rendezvous was to be in space hab with a handheld laser like they use for traffic mm -hmm. uh, measurements and, and monitoring this, the satellites that came in because it gave me a nice angle on it. So I was back in space hab all by myself and it gave, I've never done a spacewalk but I think it gave me much the same feeling as someone who does a spacewalk because I was back there all by myself. It felt like I was kind of in my own little spacecraft. Mm -hmm. I could hear on the comp system what was going on, but I was back there all by myself watching this beautiful satellite come in. Mm. That was really fun. Very nice, yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of the, any of the other ones that you want? Um, you had so many you want to make a right. Perhaps the last one you might want to make it. That's... Uh, with that mapping was kind of an interesting thing. When I was doing the re research in conjunction with this, that mapping was sort of interesting. It, it was very interesting. So we made a three-dimensional I like maps map. anyway. Go ahead. Ah, Sorry. Okay. Um, the job is to make a three-dimensional map of the Earth, which has been done bits and pieces. It's a very important thing to, to know, right? Where are the mountains and where are the, oh, yeah. the rivers and things for all kinds of things. Watershed, understanding which way is the water going to flow when you have a heavy storm. Which way do the mudslides go? Where are the forest fire is going to go? Where do you? Right. Where is the best place to parachute in if you're going to try to fight a forest fire? All kinds of amazement. Where do you put a cell tower to get the highest peak in the surrounding area? Right. Amazingly important stuff. And much needed. 
much needed. And the, the existing maps at the time that we flew in 1990, sorry, in 2000, uh -huh. 2000 was they were they were pieced together from bits and pieces, which means there were artificial cliffs where you tried to stitch data sets together that had somewhat different registrations. Mm -hmm. And there were different times of the year, so there were some effects of snow and leaf coverage and things that, that were variable. All right. And there were different resolutions because the different sources had different capabilities. So, and the, probably the biggest problem was the artificial cliffs. So we were able in our 11-day mission to map the entire surface. It's like all the land from 57 south to sorry, 60 no 60 and I'm 60 south to 57 north latitude, which is like 80 percent of where the people all the people live. Mm -hmm. And and in in we did the whole thing in nine days. Wow. So it's a very coherent data set. Higher resolution overall than anywhere else than had been previously made. There were individual pieces like areas around cities and stuff where things were very that were known better than that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the general you know climate area and stuff, it's just amazing. It mm -hmm. underlays Google Maps. It's it's a public data set. DoD funded part of it. I'm sure their data set has better resolution than, than the sure. one that I know about. But uh -huh. the publicly available one was still much better. We were told by the JPL team that was running the science part that they got a call from a trucking company during the mission that with trucks it's much more important to know the altitude changes of a route than the length of the route. Hmm. Hmm. So when there's construction going on and they have to find an alternate route, they would like to have really good elevation maps. And they couldn't wait to get all of our data. Oh. You want to know how soon? <laughs> of course, it right. took two years to do sure. it. But sure. it's a publicly available available data set that's used, you know, all over the place. I I ended up out at Ames with the Kepa project for a while, as you know. That's one of your questions further down. Yeah, My we were interviewing people for a, for some job positions we had, and this guy came in as a programmer, and you know, so what do you do for hobbies? He said, oh, I had this really cool one where I um, been making a map of the San Francisco area around my house. And there's this really great data set from this 2000 shuttle mission that's got such wonderful resolution. <laughs> and he didn't know I'd been on that flight. He didn't know I was astronaut at that point. <laughs> so funny. Nice to hear those kinds of things. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, in terms of value to the planet, right. that, that mission is probably the single most important space mission we will ever fly in terms of a single mission. Right. And it's value to the total planet at the time it was flown. Right. Obviously, something like the moon landing is important, but it's part of a suite. The moon sure. landing wasn't a standalone mission. Right, exactly. And, and in terms of true impact to the planet as a whole, it's huge for our country. Right, exactly. For the planet as a whole, it wasn't, I don't think, quite the same impact as this right. one, even though people know much less about it. They don't appreciate They don't know where the data is coming from. Right. It's really huge. Right. How about uh, one other thing, and you, that uh, the 57, that shuttle amateur radio experiment, that was kind of interesting. It was. Yeah. <laughs> that's always a, a pleasure. That actually, my best amateur radio story is from my third flight, second uh -huh. flight, the one that rendezvous with the Mir. Okay. We also had the amateur radio on that flight, and the we had a Russian crew member on board because of the rendezvous with Mir, and he had a Mir call sign. Mir apparently has its own call sign because so many of those guys have, have ham licenses. Mm -hmm. And we were doing some just, you know, open call. And we were not a scheduled ham pass. Sure. And and he was calling on the radio, and we got somebody on the west coast of the U.S., and he said, oh, I'm talking to Mir. And we're like, no, no, you're talking to the shuttle. But he's speaking to this guy with a Russian accent with a Mir call sign. <laughs> we, could, we only had like 30 seconds, right? We could not convince him that he was talking to the space shuttle. <laughs> And because, because we were doing the Mir rendezvous on that flight, we're, sure. we were in a Mir orbit. Sure. Right? And so it was, that was really funny. <laughs> and I learned from that that there's so many ham operators that you basically can't do open ham calls from the shuttle over the U.S. because you get so many calls coming in. It's just noise. Uh, pro probably many people don't realize that there are that many, right. in, in particularly yeah. in today's times. So you really can only pick up people on the coast. As sure. you're coming up to the coast, you get a few people with the strongest signal at the edges if you want to talk to a single person after that there's just too many and you oh, can't okay. talk. Okay. So most of our talking is done on scheduled contacts where we have we have separate frequencies that we use for the scheduled contacts sure. so that aren't public publicly used frequencies. All right. Okay. So we can those are pretty clear. Yeah. Uh, Janice you mentioned a moment ago about the Kepler. Did you want to make any any other comment on that particular uh, when you were involved when you were a science director out there? Sure. Mm -hmm. I ended I was was after my that fifth flight that we just talked about, uh -huh. 
and it, astronauts are pretty good at math, and I could look at the office, and I'd had five flights, and, and I was, I w what I was told was that because of the number of people we had and the number of flights I'd had, that it would be at least four years before I would fly again. And, and four years was a long time, so that just they would talk to me then. I had no idea if they would be able to fly me then or not, but it would be at least that long. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking four years from now, they're going to have more people. They're just not going to. So I was looking around for something. If I, didn't, if I wasn't flying in space, I didn't have to be here at Johnson Space Center. And I did look at coming back to Purdue. Purdue has always said, you know, if we don't have a job for you, tell us what we want and we'll make it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I would still, I, that's still a possibility. I, I think Purdue is just a wonderful place. But I just, the academic life just doesn't, you know, resonate with me. MIT has said this basically the same thing. And mm -hmm. I, you know, the same thing there. I just don't. And I looked at some of the private companies, Orbital Sciences. I worked at Orbital for three years after I graduated with my PhD. Yeah, I saw that on your, uh-huh. And they said the same thing. Tell us where you want to work. And, and again, and they're now, they now have an office here in Houston. And, and I go and visit over there and have fun with them. But, you know, I just wasn't ready. I, I love the space program, the human spaceflight program. I love the people in it. I, I love the energy, and I just I think it's a wonderful, valuable program. I, right. And so I, this opportunity came up at Kepler, where it was one actually one of my friends from the radar mapping mission who was at JPL was complaining to me one day about how JPL and Ames were partnered, and it was really hard because the all the science people were at Ames and all the ops people were at JPL, and people were having to commute back and forth. And he said, I really wish I had an ops person who was resident at, JP, at Ames. And Ames had, um, had such a position, they'd, they'd advertise for it and really didn't get anybody who, who the scientists liked that also had a good ops background. Mm -hmm. And that year and a half I spent at Rice in astrophysics is what made the difference. Okay. Because I had just enough of an astronomy background. I had all the basic courses. I had some the professors there who, who were known in the, in the aerospace, in the astronomy mm -hmm. community who would recommend me who were known to the people at Ames, and that was just enough to say, well, she's got a good enough science background, and she obviously has a strong ops background, that they reopened the applications for that position. Of course, got a few more besides me, but I got the job out there. Because that, that you know, that's what, using my ops background, using my astronomy background, is really a great opportunity to do sure. something else valuable to the human spaceflight program, right. which I include, you know, the, the robotic missions and things in, because it, it's um, a lot of people involved in that. and. Went out there for three years. Um, ended up, they had some budget problems, and decided that they were going to eliminate my position. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, expected me to stay out Ames and do something else. But there, there really wasn't anything else there. And and by that time, NASA, the NASA office had started to lose some people because the shuttle program was, you know, it was the end was in sight, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and because this was post, see, this is 2004, 2007, -ish, so it was post Columbia, mm -hmm. um, and, and all the changes that happened because of that. And so I ended up being able to come back here in mm -hmm. 2007 and rejoin the astro office with a, with no expectation of flying. They told me that when they said, you know, we're happy to have you back. We'd love to have you work our technical jobs, but do not expect to fly again, which doesn't mean that they wouldn't let me fly. Right, I understand. They just wanted to know that, that there were absolutely no guarantees that I would fly again. Okay, um, so that's I, what you're currently doing. That's what I'm currently doing. Right. Yeah. And uh, that, the Kepler is an amazing project. I, you, they have now six, I think, plants identified by Kepler that weren't known. Kepler, of course, has found a bunch of plants that we already knew about, which is a great way of verifying the data. Sure, sure. And the, trip, the AAS, I should look it up, the AAS meeting is annually in January, and I expect when that meeting comes around this year that you're going to just see a flood of new discoveries for Kepler. It's okay. really an amazing project. Okay. And it feels so privileged to have been able to spend some time on it. I would think it. so. Uh, one thing I did want, uh, was on uh, what people, my researchers might be interested, what do you do? Is there any leisure when you're, you know, in space? What sort of activities did to uh, you Yes, do? one of my favorite stories. I have a couple of favorite stories I tell them again and again because everybody likes them and I love them. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> on my first flight, we were scheduled to land after eight days, but we had bad weather and we couldn't get down to the Cape. We ended up waving off twice, so we, we landed on the 10th day instead of the 8th day. Well, once you got everything shut down and ready for entry, there really isn't much to do. Sure. Most experiments can't be reactivated, and so I had a little bit of time. On every flight, you can bring two things with you for your own personal morale boosting, and I had brought with me a copy of Isaac Asimov's book, Foundation, one of my favorite science fiction stories. Mm -hmm. So I took it out 
and went up to the flight deck and read it by Earthlight, which is sunlight reflected off the Earth. Oh, how nice. And that was just a really great you know, oh, what a closing nice of the circle. Best science reading you ever had. <laughs> right, and science fiction is actually what originally got me interested in the space program. I picked up Madeline Lengel's A Wrinkle in Time at a public library in sixth grade mm -hmm. and got me hooked on science fiction from there to the space program. And, and I, you know, after I flew, and I was thinking, you know, these books that I fly, I don't need to keep them. They're flown books. They're special. So I contacted Asimov's family. He had already died. Uh -huh. um, and the, the book ended up at a museum in New York. Uh, I understand. I've never been there. Sure. And, and after that, I would, con well, I didn't really consciously think about it until, like, my third flight. I started contacting the, the authors in advance and saying, is there a copy you want flown? And I actually flew from Madeline Lengel a copy of A Wrinkle in Time that she sent me. Oh, uh -huh. very nice. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, now, synergistic activities. You, uh, activities you've been involved with at Purdue. You come back, you've done the space and your, the SWE, and make a couple comments on that. Coming back? Yeah. Um, it's actually it's very special. I love, I suppose, as you know, I, one of the things I think I do every time I come back to campus is talk to the, the seminar that the Freshman Engineering puts on the Women in, Women in Engineering Seminar, okay. which is not SWE specifically. I actually haven't connected much with SWE. Okay. But, I but it's a Women in Engineering group. program, isn't it? Right. Right. Uh huh. Sure. Um, and I, I love talking to the group, and I tell them the story about my torturous college career, because you know they're struggling with that. Mm -hmm. And they think that people like me, when you look at my bio, wow, you know, she, and I, cause I'll say, I wanted to be an astronaut since I was sixth grade, and they'll think, you know, she just laid out her path and she cruised. <laughs> but it, it wasn't like that. There at are all. some bumps. <laughs> right. Um, and so I really, I thoroughly enjoy talking to that group. I try to do it every time I go up there. I, I, I've been up there, I mean, the, the summer, the fall space days, I would think. Right, about. yeah. Um, it's another group of people that it's just fun to, to watch those people get excited about math and science. And Purdue does a, such a nice job of organizing those programs and keeping it going. A lot of them are student. That's right. Have your student participation, which is another wonderful thing that Purdue does is really keep the students involved. Right. Um, I've been back twice for the where they invite the Purdue alumni back for a homecoming in conjunction with a president change. Mm -hmm. you know, so when Francis Cordova came in and um, when Dr. Beering left, uh -huh. we were all up there. And well, that was definitely. a big thing. You remember? And they have that great picture taken in front of the Union, all the right. astronauts. Yep. It's yeah, great. the flowers. Oh, yeah. it's a great picture. <laughs> Wonderful picture. Right, exactly. Um, and, the, and the Armstrong Hall, of course, right. I was there when they did that. Right. It, it's really, it, you know, of course, I connect a lot of astronaut alums down here. Sure. Purdue alums, but it's, it's, it's fun to, because when I was at Purdue, you know, I spent hours with Neil Armstrong. <sighs> he was at that one with the, that you were just talking about. Uh-huh. Um, and to see that whole spectrum, all those generations of astronauts all together was Purdue did that for me. They were all gone by the time I got yeah. to the office, right? It's awesome, right. <laughs> um, so I, I got at least as much out of it as Purdue did having those reasons. Oh, and Bob, one of the, now that you're talking about amazing experiences in your life, uh -huh. one of the most memorable experiences in my life is during one of those trips, they had us go on stage in the, um, in the union mm -hmm. with the men's glee club. Okay. And so we were singing, you know, Hail Purdue. They were doing the singing. Of course, we were supposed to be singing, and I sang very quietly. <laughs> but I had this gorgeous baritone singing right into my ear. Um, that was just one of the one of the most memorable. You, you know, you haven't lived until a world class baritone has been singing "Hail <laughs> Purdue" in your ear. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you you know you've also talked to some. What do you get uh, when you're dealing with say the elementary school? They do they? I imagine a question you get asked is, "How can you be an astronaut?" Or that's a different group. Well, the the. The grade school ones are mm. young enough that I pretty regularly get the, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Oh, okay. The older groups won't ask that. No, no, no. In the no. public no. forum. How about, do they ask about eating? And even, how do you they eat in space? They often don't. And what oh. I do is I bring food samples with me. And okay. I show it to them, but they often, I would say maybe only, they ask the bathroom question more often than the That's interesting. <laughs> um, they ask all kinds. Of, we had one of the most perceptive questions I ever got was like, I was like a third grade student. I said, why is the shuttle black on the bottom and white on the top? You know, what a perceptive question. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a thermal issue. Right. The bottom radiates and the um, it, it, the bottom has the heat of entry. Sure. So it's black to get black body radiation, and the, but the black is very hard to maintain, and so those stuff on the top. 
the white gives it a reflective surface, so you can do thermal control. If you're up in space and you're getting too hot, you can turn the white side and right. Right. Um, reflect that. If it's sunlight that's wrong, you can turn the white side up and reflect it. Mm -hmm. So it's all about thermal control. And I, nobody else has ever... Very perceptive. Yeah. It really had, had many observations on TV and had noticed that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, then the other thing you'll get is grade school. You go to grade school class, uh -huh. say any questions, every hand goes up, right? You answer questions for 45 minutes, every hand is still in the air. <laughs> you go to a high school class, any questions, you're lucky to get two hands. Interesting. So I get in the habit of giving long answers to high school groups because it's the peer pressure, right? They don't want to ask a stupid question. Yeah, I understand. Good variation in the groups. Uh, awards and honors. You got the. Um, I w was one thing I wanted to ask you about was that Zona Amelia Earhart um, Fellowship. How did that come about? I did. That was. You know, we do have the Amelia Earhart Scholarship here at Purdue. I, and I, I, I know about that now. Right. Yes. And I, I've been on the committee. Tony Hawkins. Um, and I have been on the committee for for several years, and uh, I really enjoyed. And Carolyn Gary is the one that really got a lot of that going when she was, you know, still around. So, but I just wondered about was that something you got through Purdue or? No, oh, okay. I was just looking at ways of funding my graduate curriculum okay. so that my parents would. Okay, that's an international organ. The Zonta, I recognize the name. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, how about the uh, the NASA spaceflight medals? Could for researchers, could you comment on those? Well, that it's you interesting received? because the, the Amelia Earhart one actually means a lot more to me. Okay. Because the NASA ones you get automatically for flying on the space shuttle. I see. Well, researchers so they understand the, the significance of it. Right. That's for, a good for, point. For people that, in, you know, it's a very prestigious medal. And it's kind of interesting because when I was getting it, I was like, well, you know, this isn't right. I mean, yes, I, I did something that caught me this medal, but, but I didn't do anything okay. specific to this medal, right? And doesn't that dilute it for all those people who worked really hard and did something really... And they said quite the contrary. They feel very proud to be part of a group that includes astronauts. Right, exactly. Well, that was an interesting perspective that I hadn't heard before. So the, I think the medal means more to the organization, which I am happy to help them with. Right. In that case, and to me, because it was, it was on, you know, the flying space, as far as I was concerned, was, you know, having a successful space flight was the real sure. award. But it's the, it's the team, everybody that's involved in it. Right. All right. right. Okay. And I just looked at the January AAS meeting is this week. So um, I expect you'll be hearing a lot of Kepler news okay. from that meeting. Okay. It'll be very interesting. One thing I, I was interested, I got that Big Ten Centennial Honor in 95 along with Tim McGinley. Mm. That, mm -hmm. That's very nice. I, I've interviewed Mr. McGinley, so it was ah, really nice. Okay. Very nice. appreciate that. Uh, are you still active in any professional associations at all? or? I'm hmm? not. Okay. Um, I you have got over the years been in SWE, uh, okay. AIAA, which is the aerospace engineering one, mm -hmm. triple E, which is electrical engineering one. Sure. Um, and I never found those to be particularly helpful to okay. me. I know they are to people have different, it's a great networking source for many people. Sure. But but I, I didn't find that to be a, a, the time spent there didn't help me as much as doing something else, like going and giving talks. Right, exactly. Which, which I would, I just find that much more right. satisfying way to spend my time. I love talking as much as I can do to Especially okay. the young kids, but oh, yeah. even the older kids, right? The older kids have the money. Oh sure. And if you can make, make them happy too, is that's right? Exactly. Support the space right. program. Yeah. And 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 you get their kids as a bonus. Usually, I went and gave a talk to a company that's involved in the in, in the uh, space program out in California, and they they sponsored a big event that I went to that was what funded me coming out there. But they held a small event for the company employees, oh. and the family brought all their kids. Oh, how nice. Oh. I mean, even though that wasn't why I was there, that was the one I enjoyed more of the two, right? Because the kids <laughs> had such a blast. The company had given them all T-shirts that, you know, space on a space theme, and I signed all their T-shirts, and oh, it was really fun. what a great event! That's yeah. right. I uh, want now the Virginia Kelly Carnes Archives and Special Collections. We appreciate very much uh, the materials that you've given and the program that was that uh, when you were here. That's very nice. I have one question about that. My mother says there's a a plate that she went through her stuff and, and sent it all to Purdue. Okay. And the Madison Historical Society would like it back. Okay. 
that something that can be done, and how do I submit that request? Well, I tell you what, you might want to, um, I should tell you first that Judy Shoemaker is going to be leaving the library. She's been appointed the development, head of development and advancement for the new School of, of um, health, and, health and Human Sciences, okay? Oh, okay? So we're having a little, the uh, library's having something for her tomorrow. Okay. But what, I, uh, what I'll do is I'll just make a note. You might want to, you could send something to Judy. So far we have not heard who's, you know, is going to be taking over. I suggest that go ahead and send it to Judy Shoemaker because somebody will be t getting the mail and things of that sort. And I'll make a note because when I, when I see Judy, I'll make a note that you'll be sending something about this particular plate. Does that sound okay? okay? Yep, that sounds great. Okay. Um, and you've got the outstanding event, okay. Um, uh, up, or tradition, how about an outstanding event? So that's a really interesting question. I, it comes in so many different forms, right? Sure. And one of the things that you come to realize is, you know, as you get older and wiser is, and this is a this is actually a quote I just came across recently. Uh -huh. There, there are no special moments. They're all the same. Every moment right. is a, is really a special moment. If you're really paying it, that this moment will never come again. And right. you should live it. And, and sure, there's always some that stand out more. But if you really think about it, you, you discover that you you know the, the most joyous in your moment in your life could be anything. That's right. One okay. of the things that just happened to me recently, I was I'm trying to work with a holistic garden. And I'm struggling because it's I mean people have the concept that I'm trying to accomplish, which mm -hmm. is, you know, native plants. I want it to be edible, but I don't want to really grow. I'm like, D dandelions are fine, right? True. My mother's like, you're going to make a dandelion garden? You know, anyway, right. um, <laughs> and I, I was, I had some health issues this year and that I just didn't have time to spend on my garden. So, of course, I don't use pesticides or anything and the weeds are getting really bad. And I went on a trip and I, when I was away on the trip, I said, you know, I should just get a gardener and just have them do it. Hopefully they'll do it in a way that doesn't destroy what I was trying to accomplish. I've had that happen before. You, you hire somebody to come in and mm -hmm. they don't understand what you're doing. They dig up the wrong things, right? Because right. they're, they're dandelions. Dig them up, right? <laughs> I understand. Um, and I'm driving and coming around the corner to my house and I see that the, the front bed is weed free. I'm like, wow. I wonder if my neighbor got so annoyed because he, he'd complained a couple of times. He didn't really complain. He just said you know, things about, you know, that's a different you know, way to keep your yard or something, you know. <laughs> and I thought maybe I'm, my neighbor got so annoyed he came over and did some weeding and I um, went in the house and looked out the window and the whole yard that I could see, it turns out it was about a third of the yard, but what I could see out the window was all weed free. My Houston sister and a couple of friends came over while I was gone and weeded the whole thing. And of course, wouldn't you know, they picked the hottest day. <laughs> of the whole summer for the day they were going to do it. It's like it was over 100 degrees. They just they suffered, and it was such the mo that was that was one of the most memorable moments of my life. That walk, sounds driving to that, and that you know the love that that expressed, and the, right. and the awareness of what I needed and how they could help. It was just amazing. That's right. I agree. Um, um, yeah, there are lots. I can tell you lots of special 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 space stories, and and that's the stories people want here when I go on trips, but doesn't you know I understand and I think your point is well taken I think this is good sometimes people uh, oftentimes I've heard that when I met my wife or I met my husband so it, it, it diff people have different takes on it but I think right. you've spoken very nicely about it and in closing with the science and technology engineering and math uh, and the what any comment or comment on that and in relation say to the space or space program or whatever yeah one of the doing? things that, that I think is really important is Technology is everywhere. Sure. And if you can get people interested in technology, then people who are you know, clerks at the grocery store and have to struggle with the new machine coming in for doing scanning, right? Right. If you can get them interested and aware at a young age that all that stuff becomes easier for them, right. it doesn't matter what profession they go into. Good point. It's going to help them. And, and I think that's, that's a, you know, one of the most important things. that we, People ask, you know, why are we spending all this money on moon rocks? That's, in my opinion, we're not spending the money on moon rocks. We're spending the money on inspiring people to study math and science. Right, exactly. That's worth a lot of money. Your point's a good one, and it's going to be it's part of your daily living, and so that, you know, that you don't need to be afraid of it. There's people there to help you, and it, it'll, it'll make it easier for you in your daily living. Right. Good. Good point. Janice, anything that I forgot to ask or anything in closing? I don't think so. I think that was a pretty thorough well, interview. Well, it was very good. I hope that, are your plans, will you be, um, do you, have you come for the um, 
the SLEE program, which is usually Engineers Week in February. Do you ever kind of come for that? I don't think I've ever been. I don't even okay. know what the SLEE program is. Uh, well, they have sort of a job fair is what they ah, it's at the job fair, and I think it's been going for some time, and they uh, they usually have it in Engineers Week. But our, do your plans, I hope when you come to campus, uh, maybe we can do the video. We can moderate a little bit and, and enhance some of the questions that we asked today. Okay. Um, and I will host you for lunch and ah, uh, give you a little nice. tour of the archives. What changes? Maybe wonderful. by that time we'll have a new head. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, probably this year you know, is the last, we think, the last shuttle flight. So I, I'm trying okay. to. Um, okay. I actually have an award from the through the Air Department that I'm. It's an engineering all department award. It's, a, it's presented by the engineering department, but from my experience in the aeros department and and they've been trying to give it to me for a couple of years and they understand they said that it's you mean quite at, purdue, at purdue yeah it's oh, quite okay. common that that you know the, the day they have to present it the people they want to give it to just can't come because they're, they're definitely ordering these to very senior people who have tight pitches and i and um it's in the spring and i told them that, that probably this year it's like right on top of the at the time the, the last shuttle flight okay and that, so probably if nothing else the spring of 2012 I'll be in to get that award. Okay. Well, that will be good. Um, but hopefully I'll be back before that. Oh, I do. I think okay. you will. Okay. Janice, thank you very much. My best wishes and Happy New Year. Now, look forward to meeting you soon, I ah, hope. That's thank great. you. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye. <clears throat>